as we're attending very well regarded workshops, uh, which catalyzed a lot of people and started a lot of PhD students on their way. So I'd like you to welcome Katina Michael. Well, hello everyone. Uh, hello Melbourne. Hello ACE 2019. Hello Australia. Uh, you can tell I miss Melbourne and Sydney a lot. Uh, thank you, Marcus, for those very uh, kind words and introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you all uh, from Arizona. Forgive me for not being with you uh, in person, but I do hope to convey the same level of interactivity from over here. I'm hoping to give some opening remarks, really, and then open the floor to questions. And uh, in doing so, I hope that we can start a discussion that will last the whole day through. First, uh, I'd like to say a big thank you to um, Professor Marcus Wigan, whom I came into contact with around about the end of 2005. Uh, someone who's been an incredible mentor to me and someone uh, who's written work probably 20 to 30 years ahead of its time. Um, I find that Marcus's work is increasingly relevant and that we have to go back uh, to refer and cite it uh, as often as possible. So just because something was written in the 70s or 80s, it doesn't mean that uh, we ignore it. Um, a second thank you to uh, the delegates at ACE 2019. Uh, at least four of you have already touched base with me overnight, and I appreciate your encouragement. I just wanted to say that sometimes in raising awareness about professional ethics, what you find is uh, it's a lonely platform, and it's not a very popular platform uh, because of the way the world is. So uh, I appreciate your messages, and uh, please let's stay in touch. And if possible, I encourage you all, if you're not already members of the IEEE Society on the Social Implications of Technology, to actually become active members and volunteers, and also to submit your work to uh, our flagship magazine and pending transactions, uh, which should go live within the next two weeks. Uh, and in the transactions, we're equally looking for research papers, and in the magazine, variety of uh, sort of uh, contributions from leading edge opinion pieces, commentaries, and even peer reviewed uh, research. So I look forward to receiving some of your work, uh, either uh, extensions of these conference papers that you've presented or new uh, contributions. So the title of my presentation is Professional Ethics and Technology in the Cyber Age. And I wanted to break down this talk by offering 15 observations. Uh, on professional ethics and technology uh, with corresponding examples that I've come across in my research and my life. And then I wanted to open up to questions of which you may contribute further observations or make reflections or critical comments on the things that I've said this morning. So the first thing is the gravity, the gravity of saying you're a professional and the gravity of professional ethics and technology in the cyber age. And here I'm specifically talking about science, technology, and engineering. I've left out mathematics from the STEM, but I want to look at professionalism and professional ethics uh, within these three domains. I worked for Nortel Networks for six years uh, out of Australia, but had the great fortune of traveling Asia and Canada and the US, and even doing projects uh, that were based even in France, for instance, or Afghanistan. And some of the things I learned in that six-year period when I was still, uh, I hadn't even turned 21 when I joined the company full-time, have stayed with me a long, long time. In fact, I would say it was the critical period of my acceleration, both as a practitioner, uh, somebody who was exposed to industry, government contracts, uh, wide area systems that covered a whole country, uh, the deregulation of telecommunications and much more. And I got to see exactly how the world worked. At the time, however, while I was doing work, I did not have much time to reflect on my practice. That's something I think I was taught, but neglected given the immense workload and pressure I was under. And also the fact that I was traveling, enjoying my life as a young person and thinking, oh, this is great. You know, I'm on a business class flight, week in, week out. I have a, 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 an Amex card, which uh, has an almost unlimited uh, capacity uh, within reason. 
and this is a pretty good life. I get to celebrate uh, different countries as an expat and much more. That started to wear thin on me, I think, the older I got, uh, probably in my fifth year, when I started to realise that it wasn't always so straightforward. I started to get invitations uh, to work on projects, for example, rebuilding Afghanistan, rebuilding Kabul. And at the time, GIS data was closed about Afghanistan, and I tried to get uh, enough information through geographic information system suppliers, and nobody wanted to touch it. Nobody wanted to give me data, even for South Korea at the time. They were talking around 1998 and then 2001. So the question was, here I was trying to do a project uh, we had seen geopolitical uh, circumstances mean that uh, part of Kabul was obliterated, literally, and the telecommunications towers were knocked out. And here I was, working for a, a, a corporation that was based out of Canada and also had bought out Bay Networks in the US that was then going to rebuild that which had been obliterated by the mother state. And I felt quite uneasy. When I couldn't get the data and I had to make estimates, I went to CNN and downloaded images of where the bombs had been dropped. And I made an assumption that a mobile switching center might be required in all of those droppage points. And I overlaid in my PowerPoint, is a high level design, uh, these base station and mobile switching center towers based on the demand and based on where the bombs had fallen. And I thought that was going to be one of the last projects I was ever going to be involved in, and in fact, it was. I then moved over into academia. But my, my bosses and directors were mostly French Canadians, and they used to wear a signet ring. It's called the iron ring on their, usually their left hand and their pinky finger. And it was explained to me the symbolism behind wearing this signet ring. Rings have always had an incredible historical significance. I mean, when we get married, we wear a ring. Uh, when we do things uh, and, and in friendship, we wear a friendship ring. And usually that's a position of responsibility. You get that ring, you put it on, and you don't take it off. And you feel different when you do. And so the engineers in Canada, because of um, issues uh, in the building of bridges that unfortunately had collapsed, decided that in providing someone a qualification, it was one thing, I give you a degree, you're a qualified engineer, but in actual conduct, it was about giving over responsibility. It was the gravitas of being a professional and being a good professional with authority. And I think back uh, to uh, the prodigal son, who was also in that biblical passage in the New Testament, given a ring by his father. Despite that he had spoiled uh, everything he had been given, his inheritance, he had you know, tossed it away, he came back and his father provided him with a differentiator. It was that ring. Now, over the last couple of days, some of my contacts in Canada have talked about an oath. What an engineers or AI specialists take a, a, an oath to say that they will uphold values within the profession. And some people I've seen on Twitter have said that won't work. You know, people take oaths every day and they don't stick to them. And others have said it's a great idea. The second thing I want to mention is the practice and goal of profit maximization in most of our businesses today. And that comes usually at any cost. Um, it includes corruption, uh, and some of this corruption is evidenced during audits. Uh, and it also includes distasteful uh, occasions and events and processes. And mostly these are unwritten. Nobody really speaks about them, uh, but we've all seen them. Uh, we can all detect them uh, in the workplace. And sometimes uh, there could be whistleblowers who uh, uncover the corruption. And other times uh, you just reflect on this, be quiet and keep about your business. Uh, two things I had witnessed was hearsay on uh, how we do work with India, for instance, and I won't mention the corporation in question, but it was always about, you know, when you do work with India, there's always some money passed under the table. Now, as a young person, how would I take this, perhaps with a grain of salt, and in other times, perhaps you questioned uh, that that was actually how practice occurred. 
Now, in other situations, I found distastefulness, and I'll describe this as a young female. Uh, when I was working on bids, uh, considerable bids, for example, uh, $500 million over three years uh, for some of the biggest telecommunications deployments in the Southern Hemisphere, I do recollect being at events that were supposed to be sort of launch events uh, prior to the shortlisting uh, of the bid vendors and prior to the enactment of an awarded contract and seeing a whole lot of women uh, who were somewhat voluptuous surrounding uh, and serving uh, these men in power. And I have to say during the time I was quite naive uh, thinking, who are these women? That's great. They look very interesting. And then later finding out that these women were escorts hired to impress the customer. Now, these things are things that people do not talk about. And perhaps I can talk about them because two of the four companies I've actually had experience with are actually failed organizations. And they failed for reasons, I would say, of unethical behavior, unethical conduct, and much more. I now want to talk about my third observation. It's the design and development of predatory products that have a dual functionality. Seemingly, uh, they're there to, uh, on the, uh, to, 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 to serve a custom, customer's needs, but at the same time, they're siphoning data, and data, of course, being the new oil. So on the one hand, uh, we believe that we're getting something for free, and on the other, uh, the data that we are contributing is being used and abused. And of course, the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal comes to mind there. So it's really not a dual purpose technology, it's not free, and in fact it's a single purpose aimed at purely extracting data and details from citizenry and consumers. My fourth observation is the deliberate rhetoric uh, and act of what's called intended consequences of products that were allegedly um, unknown knowns. And here I'll describe Donald Rumsfeld uh, when he was searching for weapons of mass destruction um, in Iraq, and he came out with the, the known knowns, you know, and the rhetoric that talked about the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. But there was one category, this is a quadrant, it's not three, it's a quadrant, this, this known and unknown, it's a quadrant. And he forgot to mention the, the, those things uh, we intentionally refuse to acknowledge that we know actually exist, okay? So it was a deliberate act, as Zizek says, it was a deliberate act of leaving that fourth quadrant out to basically um, defy the unknown knowns. These are things we actually do know, but we turn a blind eye and say, no, we didn't know that was happening. And here I can provide for you an example, a recent one, where Google announced it had accidentally left audio sensors in the Nest Guard Protect product. You know, how do you actually accidentally leave sensors uh, in devices through the product development stage? I don't know. And they noted after they were caught out that they did update their product specification page. Well, good for them. But I see that these things happen repeatedly in the industry. We let them go. There are no mechanisms uh, apart from measly fines, which you don't really uh, hurt the organization somewhat. Uh, we're talking about organizations now that are earning um, into the billions. We also uh, collected a lot of MAC addresses using Street View and the vehicles that went through, and we're also catching out people for warrantless tracking. Again, uh, we identified Google as um, uh, an invader here, a violator, uh, in seven different countries as per the GDPR. But this, uh, of course, we're used to this. We're so desensitized to this news um, that we almost are observers, and we sit back you know, criticize what has occurred, and the next day we move on uh, to more important things like feeding our families and making sure we have shelter and paying our bills on time, which many of us are struggling with, not because we don't have the money, but because of this information overload. The fifth observation I have is the proliferation of continuous principles, codes of ethics, and company-specific policies. Think Tank A, Institute B, Research Group C, um, all have the answer to the professional ethics. Uh, we just have to look at a blog by the wonderful uh, Professor Alan Winfield, whom identifies 17 AI principles and codes of conduct and ethical approaches. 
And uh, one interesting tweet I've seen over the last couple of weeks has been, okay, this over an abundance of AI ethics principles, but who's actually putting them into practice? And we can completely list and relist and redefine and uh, have ontological approaches, but until we embed them in the practice of development or until we actually say, okay, and how are our employees now going to embrace these, then we're almost losing the actual battle uh, and not keeping pace with what some people t term AI ethics. The sixth observation I have that we may act ethically ourselves as employees, but our employer may not. And this is twofold. Uh, in the name of transparency, for example, in global demand and supply, uh, we look at whether there are adequate budgets that have been provided for in situ context. So I open the doors to actually um, uh, have a business in country Y versus country Z, but I don't provide the impetus to look at local laws and regulations and policies and markets and value systems based across all of these regions. I treat them as if they were homogenous. And in fact, they're anything but homogenous. And so we seem to be, perhaps when we do become aware of these different differentiators in terms of laws and regulations, what we do, instead of uh, responding with an in situ context response, what we do is we just pick up and leave. Well, that's too hard for us. I'll go somewhere where there's a tax haven or I'll go somewhere else whereby uh, I don't have to be under these laws. I don't have to be accountable for these things. And of course, we talk about public interest technology in this realm. And then the next level uh, of this kind of uh, monitoring is the issue with employees themselves actually being surveilled, whether that's for the number of seconds or milliseconds they spend in specific tasks in a process, or whether it's about how many papers they publish at the end of an annual uh, term, or whether it's chasing international rankings in academic institutions. It's almost like we've lost sight of why we are doing what we are doing. Academics also are professionals, we're just different. And here I want to talk about the quantified professional as opposed to the qualified professional, of whom the qualified is the one who looks at the world's problems and says, I'm going to tackle the hardest things ahead of me, whether they are things like climate change or otherwise, instead of perhaps wasting our time uh, generating on a treadmill papers that are of no significance uh, or need to the community at large. So involving the community in our professionalism is extremely important and we're still scratching the surface of how to do public town halls, how to do uh, participatory design, how to do co-design. My seventh observation is the symbiosis between industry or government and perhaps industry and policing and law enforcement. Here we have an interweaving uh, around existing processes in order to be able to infiltrate different spaces. And this is a new phenomenon. Uh, for example, products like the Ring product, which is a doorbell product that takes a picture of anyone who actually comes close to your home, has, has acted to create some symbiosis between law enforcement who can respond without an independent call from a human to a neighborhood based on the color of someone ringing a doorbell, whether they are expected to ring the doorbell and whether this, this location has been considered to be receiving too many rings on that doorbell. And this is a, almost a response, uh, an automated response. And so what we have now is neighborhoods with heightened anxiety in Arizona, for example, Chandler, where the crime rate is actually decreasing, but the anxiety levels are increasing as a result of the deployment of these products. So I can talk about IoT devices. Uh, Marcus has written widely, for instance, on smart meters in Victoria. Well, now we're not only talking about smart meters located outside the home that monitor the energy levels of the home, but we're also talking about Internet of Things devices like smoke detectors. Uh, yesterday I heard about the toilet rolls that are Internet enabled, you know, beyond the fridge. So, so when we're trying to infiltrate the house because our laws do not allow us really to step inside the boundaries and trespass our home, we're doing this in very conniving product ways and patents. And so what we're doing is 
instead of uh, you know knocking on someone's door or ringing them to do a, a, a Nielsen poll, we're actually giving them a product. We're saying, here's a product, put it in your house, it'll keep you safe, and in fact, in keeping you safe, it tells us everything that you do, from how often you flush your toilet, to how many times you brush your teeth, to how many times you actually have um, smoke detected in your home. My eighth observation is the lip service paid to co-design when users have never actually been consulted. And here I strike at the heart of professionalism and professional conduct. How do we create things? Why do we create things? I had listened to a talk uh, by the great Arthur C. Clarke, who said, look into the future of smart cities. This was in 1967. And he said, this is what the smart city will look like, but I want you to think about the unbelievable, and the unbelievable will happen. Well, I'm pretty sure, uh, as an innovator, he did not ask consumers, now what do you think about the future? He just imagined the future. Larry Page dreamed the page rank, and others have hypothesized uh, about being on LSD, for instance, while creating things like iPhones uh, once upon a time. Uh, and, and now we are all of a sudden thrust into this future that we have not actually well roadmapped. Instead of asking people, what do you need? We are actually throwing things that they don't need uh, and causing more externalities as a result. So what of market surveys and what about proof? My ninth observation um, is that the stakes are increasing for consumers. And I look at the consumer data rights fallacy. We have uh, laws now instituted to give individuals the power to commandeer their data and interoperability between one provider and another. But in fact, many NGOs are concerned that instead of empowering the consumer, these data rights are actually watering down the consent process and watering down one's ability to make a decision. I go beyond that and look at sensitive data collection here I talk about DNA uh, and biometrics and the acceptance uh, perhaps of money and grants uh, that are coming from commercial interests to pursue unethical technologies. We did hear about two Australian universities uh, last month who are under investigation for working with uh, some commercial entities in China about surveillance, uh, gate um, identification, and other things to identify dissidents and perhaps minority groups. So Norbert Wiener, uh, whom uh, Dr. Greg Adamson has spoken very widely about, was one of these people who talked about uh, this kind of money and grants as being dirty money, uh, money that we should refuse because of this military industrial complex. So as professional engineers, where does the buck stop at that point? My 10th observation, and now these are getting shorter, is that I deliberate on technologies that are released that won't work, that do not work, and that companies know won't work. You know, I remember when Cisco and Nortel were at Combat, uh, we used to call Cisco's products brochureware within the corporation, and Nortel was allegedly the Rolls Royce uh, in terms of their uh, adequate testing. Um, but of course, there comes a point where there is some kind of, uh, you know, toing and froing about how much testing is enough. But what happens when we do release products that have not been tested, applications that have not been tested under the right conditions? Well, then we get breaches, for example, in cloud computing. And so the penalties are not only um, are lacking at the moment, uh, but there's a risk ad appetite that, that one can talk about as being absorbable that won't send a company uh, completely broke. So it's about, for instance, us knowing that contactless cards cause fraud, but we'll still deploy contactless cards if encryption is on board. The 11th observation I have is that of fully autonomous systems, like driverless cars that I'm seeing uh, on the street now. I've seen them for the last 12 to 18 months here in Arizona. Um, and this notion that fully autonomous vehicles will still have an, a human inside uh, driving. I've talked to lawyers, I've talked to safety engineers, all of whom say that the human will always be in the driver's seat, even if there is no steering wheel. Because in the interim, this trillion dollar industry 
which could go broke uh, over several deaths, for example, accidents, uh, requires the human to be the scapegoat. So they will be the cause, uh, the human factors will be the cause. So as long as we, we, we want to be professionally in, professional in our conduct, we can't really continue to blame the human for all the mistakes, for example, that semi-autonomous or autonomous systems may make. And this is really a, a fundamentally flawed premise. You know, put the human in there as the guinea pig, make them be the collateral damage, point to him on liability, and everything will be fine. My twelfth observation is this notion that technology can do no wrong. It's the mantra. It's the loss of our own autonomy in questioning technology and completely blindsided and trusting technology because it works most of the time, not all the time. And here I refer to the embedded behavioral triggers that are considered consumer uh, relationship sort of mechanisms. I call them stickiness drivers that make somebody return either to a website, to a game, to a device based on behavioral analytics and driving your particular uh, interactions with something. And I think these are quite predatory. I, I make them akin to a living lab experiment. We're like that uh, mouse that's going round and round in the wheel uh, that we're actually feeding cheese to. So it's a tic-tac-toe and strategic game. My 13th observation is this experimental methodology that uh, we get products out to market quickly. It's not that they'll fail, but they have not been tested adequately. And also their whole premise has not been tested. I'll, I'll talk about intrusive, invasive, and higher end uh, technologies, technologies here like biomedical devices for the brain and body. In many cases, we've deployed technologies and we can see from the Therapeutic Goods Administration that these technologies have been harmful, there have been warnings about them, there have been callbacks, uh, there have been lots of things. Uh, for example, the material itself has not been adequately tested. Um, the basic effectiveness, for example, of deep brain stimulation devices for major depressive disorder has not been tested. And the effectiveness has not been tested. So we are deploying these things and we see them deployed. They look like they work. It's a bit like when we see robots work, uh, like Boston Dynamics robots, and we don't see the programmer that's hiding not far away, or four of them, trying to make this thing work. Uh, same thing with Sophia and, and Hanson Technologies. Anyone who looks at these um, YouTube clips of a full view, not just a, a specific field of view, can see that there's a lot of cheating going on with respect to whether these technologies really work or not. Dovetailing off that is uh, my 14th observation. It's the propagation of the tech myths. AI will take over the world. These robots will have higher intelligence than we do. Uh, we should go to Mars because, you know, the, the world will be annihilated by an asteroid before too long. Uh, we're going to live forever through these biomedical devices. And I call these myths. These are really tech myths. And I can't believe how the majority of the online world actually gets sucked in to these tech myths. Uh, and perhaps before that, uh, people reflected otherwise. But where is our ethical responsibility for sustainable development goals, for humanitarian relief, for things like rising sea levels? Where are we going when we, our eyes are on the wrong issues? And my last observation is the idea that blockchain will solve the whole world's problems. And Really, I think only blockchain may serve to hide problems in a more sophisticated context. If it's in a general ledger, then it must be true if you have access to that general ledger's transparency. But here I look at interactions, whether these are interactions between people, between devices, between sensors, at what level of granularity are we going to say the blockchain will take effect? Is it just for smart contracts? Or are we looking at movement of individuals so that we can describe alibis based on location information, identity information, and condition information in the body or on the body? So these are my 15 observations. They all... Uh, sort of uh, resume around the question of professional ethics uh, in technology in the cyber age. And my three concluding remarks are these. What do we do? Where we find ourselves in this complex meshed environment where value chain holders and supply chain holders and care chain holders are manifold in the production of a particular service, device, or product. All products today are processes. They are not individual standalone products. So we can role model, and we've always tried to do this as professionals in this space. We role model, and it's not always easy to role model. 
especially in some larger organizations. The second thing we do, and here we are starting to investigate new techniques, is to use science fiction movies as a way to create learnings beyond useful case studies where we could look at how do we feel about something? And I've seen publications come out in this space in the last six months, uh, work, for example, by Professor Andrew Maynard here at ASU, that talks about learning by reflecting on science fiction. And we have enough science fiction movies. I'm not talking about the Terminators here. I'm talking about more specific instances uh, of issues, whether it's fraud, uh, whether it's uh, corruption, whether it's the emergence of new technologies like those depicted in Minority Report, where we can respond to these uh, in a useful manner. So I emphasize values in closing and values by design and values in case studies and encouraging that kind of thing. And, and I'd like if we have time to open it to the floor. Thank you. Well, after that, I'm going to take a couple of questions and extend it a bit beyond 10. So would anybody like to start with a specific question? But if you don't, I have, I have one. Oh, great. So can you, can you hear me when I speak? Yes. Okay. Uh, Katina, as, as always, an excellent uh, uh, and beyond, uh, beyond normal collection of, of issues that you've identified. I uh, really appreciate that. And I, I see your flurry pushing in, in, in Arizona. Uh, my question relates about Australia. How do we build a community in Australia of people interested in ethics and technology? And I'm, the reason I'm saying that is because there are many, many forums at the moment. So that every, I would say there have probably been 25 or 30 significant meetings so far this year on ethics and artificial intelligence in Australia. And, just, and that's, a, that's a guess it could be twice that many. So how do we, is, do we, uh, and obviously we have international organisations such as IEEE, we have local organisations such as okay, um, Australian Computer Society, we have people who are interested from academia, from industry and so on. Is there, what would you suggest is the way to bring together the people who are thinking about this in a, in a serious sense? Thank you, Greg, um, for your encouragement. Um, I would like to talk about three things that we are doing at ASU. And the first thing is that we are providing uh, adequate capacity for joint appointments. I'm both in the School for the Future of Innovation, which is a humanities slash social sciences hub, with academics from 50 disciplines. There are 38 of us and there are 50 disciplines represented amongst us. We're all talking different ontologies, different languages. And we have joint appointments. The majority of the faculty have joint appointments. And so our job is to bridge this gap, which has been significantly siloed both in Australia and beyond, whereby we are trying to encourage debate, not only between academics and faculty members, but among our student base. I've just uh, put through uh, a cutting edge um, Masters of Science degree, for example, one of many things happening here, uh, of a Masters of Science in Public Interest Technology, which will be opened up to a vast number of backgrounds of students. Uh, these students will come from social sciences, they will come from the humanities, they will come from engineering, and placing these students within courses and degree structures that are being taught, for example, between five different schools and faculties, makes students interact in a way and presses them to think outside the box. They are engaging in discussion predominantly, not talking heads in front of a classroom. It's a flipped classroom. And so students come to the, the classroom having watched a video, perhaps a 10 minute video, and then come ready to actually either um, uh, participate in an activity which will heighten their awareness of the various perspectives. At the moment, we teach technology in a very technocentric way. We put people through methodology training, programming training. Uh, we might have a few courses, if we're lucky, on the social implications of technology, like we are supposed to by the Australian um, uh, uh, Computer Society, the ACS, that accredits our degrees. Um, and there's a large emphasis uh, in our degree structures for accreditation to actually acknowledge ethics, acknowledge social implications. But it's what's happening at the operational level that 
that matters and counts, whether you have a dedicated subject or social implications embedded within professional conduct, embedded within other coursework like machine learning courses, for instance. But by bringing disparate and diverse student bases together, you, you get to witness this amazing dialogue. It's like, what do you mean you have to critically reflect continuously till the end of the lifetime of the project? And then the engineer says to the social scientist, what do you mean? Um, I can't use this template and that I can't do a high level design and I have to start asking lots of people. Well, we've forgotten that we need to interview real people. So this interaction, I think as well, um, more uh, non-traditional lectures. So I'm not saying do lectures, but instead you can have a lecture bracket, for example, uh, a one hour or two hour space, but don't use that space in the traditional way that we've used it before. Use it to actually conduct research to see what the students are thinking and reflecting on about product innovation, about professional conduct, about a movie they've watched, about uh, what they fear in the future of the internet. I, I look at a project uh, that has been launched by Mission Publix in 200 countries, and ASU in Washington, D.C., is a part of this We the Internet, which is really about the future of the internet. And they asked only three question, questions, societal members, including the homeless, including women, underrepresented groups like uh, LGBT communities. These people are placed in, in, a, in a group of 100 and then round tables, and it's almost like a public gathering where people talk about their fears, their hopes of the internet, and, and, why, and, and why they are suffering or interested in the benefits and, and, and so forth. So I think we need to look at non-traditional mechanisms of delivery. That's what I would say. And bringing as many different stakeholders together, as you already mentioned. Katina, uh, I'm Mike Hi. Tolliver and I'm on the organising committee. And uh, when Marcus first recommended you to be a keynote, you know, I was wondering, who on earth are you? But, uh, <laughs> and why should you be in that role? Right. But uh, I really appreciate the breadth of topics that you covered because often with keynote presentations you're focused on a single thing but uh, we want to engender discussion here and you've really opened up the whole spectrum of so many really important issues for us to consider so from my point of view thank you very much you've opened really well for this conference. Oliver thank you so much I'm so encouraged by your community thank you. Well, we only have a couple more minutes, but I'd like to make one point myself, and that is I had an appointment at Melbourne University specifically to bring together 12 different disciplines and mentor them mm -hmm. how to talk to, across each other. Uh, it worked extremely well, so the students told me, and so the outcomes appear to have been. But the saddest thing is the moment the director changed, it was chopped immediately with no possibility of revival. There is a structural problem across disciplines. The silos are deepening. The financial pressures are deepening them further. We need somehow to make structures or enterprises or organizations that demonstrate that they're necessary. And I think professional organizations have got a very special role in that area. And opening the discussion to professional ethics to realize it now must become an active mode and that, in fact, we may even have to start supporting whistleblowers in order to enable this to occur is a natural outcome of the comments that you've made. So this is all the time that I've been given. So I will say thank you, Katina. You've done exactly what I expected. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you, and have a wonderful, wonderful oh, rest of the conference. I question, if you could take it. Yes. Thank you, Katrina. Uh, the interesting thing with the ethics you were talking about, I noticed one slight missing. You never mentioned anything about the ethics of the animal kingdom, where we're putting technology in yes. for the human kingdom. And I bring up the comment of now, you said the smart meters here in Melbourne and in Australia, we're now bringing up smart meters for gas and for water now so that even the mechanical water meter is becoming smart. I have colleagues that um, manage and run beekeeping, and they are finding internationally and nationally that the more technology, the more Wi-Fi, the more 3 and 4G towers that are coming in, that the bees are losing the ability to navigate, 
and the ability to pollinate or, or assist the pollination and thus the whole of that ecosystem is now coming to pieces slowly but maybe more quickly than we want it to. There's nothing I've heard on the ethics of putting technology into, into, into the environment other than how it affects us with our electricity radiation on towers, but nothing on the animal kingdom and how, in the bigger picture, that will happen. Oh, I love that comment. I just love that comment. And uh, two days ago, three days ago now, I was on PBS here in Arizona, and we were talking about how people uh, blindly navigate down uh, boat ramps, uh, down marshland, uh, into rising sea levels with their vehicles, uh, down stairwells, for example, in the one case in Sydney in Bondi Junction where an Uber driver turned into a stairwell, not, not really paying attention. And, and it's got, this remark has to do with everything that you've said. Birds migrating. They're losing their migration patterns. We're finding, after chipping uh, whales and uh, other uh, fish, that they're in waters that they shouldn't necessarily be in. What is going on with this? And, and I'm not just talking about sensors in the environment, uh, telecommunications, perhaps interference, uh, and I'm here I'm talking about electromagnetic interference, really nothing else, EMI, of which uh, our radio communications authority is well aware of. There is a heightening of interference within operational scenarios. I spoke at RADCOMS uh, in 2017, and it was EMI that was central to their concerns, right? And here in Arizona, there are EMI conferences, which I haven't been able to go to, but we're putting up so much that, of course, it's affecting the actual communications. Someone's DBS, deep brain stimulator, can be triggered off by an inventory wireless system at Best Buy's here. It's like Harvey Norman. So the DBS patient is walking down the shopping mall and his DBS is tripped. Well, what is happening in the animal kingdom is commensurate to what is occurring in our EMI operational scenarios. I agree with you. I think the problem is huge and it may well have impact on crops, on seeds, uh, on dust, on a whole gambit of things. But at the same time, we're deploying environmental sensors at rates of knots. We're collecting data that is really not useful. Okay, I've heard this in Pittsburgh. I've heard this in different states in America. We collect, we collect, we collect. It sits there. It gives us these uh, ratios or levels that don't actually make sense or are meaningless. And we're just happy because we're monitoring the environment, but in actual fact, we're not monitoring the things that you're referring to. So thank you for that excellent um, addition. Yeah. Well, thank and you, that, that point that she made about the yep. switching off of the brain stuff from that cheap Harvey Norman purchase, mm. uh, if you want to continue that discussion, my paper at five o'clock today is exactly on that sort of stuff. <laughs> I love it, Matthew. Uh, I'm glad to see that in closing we have gone back to the whole Earth catalogue and the well, which I remember being <laughs> on in the late 70s. Uh, we've had to wait 40 years for this. Thank you, Katina. Thank you, friends. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>